Hi there. Welcome to the Business of Story. I'm Park Howell, and today you and I are going to explore our primal brain operating system and why storytelling is the software that drives all of our decisions. But first, your story marketing moment. On our last show, we covered step three of the story cycle system, what I call stakes. I had to consider what's at stake for your customers to buy into your product or service offering. What do they emotionally wish to accomplish and what do they physically want to purchase to fulfill that wish? But there's more to it than just wishes and wants. What stories will you tell them to trigger their will to act? You could tell one of two stories, the optimism story, what they stand to gain when they buy into your offering, or maybe more importantly, the FOMO story of what they stand to lose by not acting at all. This is why it's critical that you understand where your audience is on their journey, and you gotta empathize with your customer about what's holding them back from buying in to what you have to offer, holding them back from acting. As you'll hear on today's show, we storytelling animals are prone to negativity bias, especially coming out of such a trying year as COVID 2020. Just think back to the last 12 months. What comes to mind first? Your accomplishments and victories, no matter how small or large, or an incident where COVID crept into your life? The impact of the economic recession, social unrest, the unnerving election and its fallout, Granted, last year was a bit of a horror show on so many levels, which unfortunately continues in many aspects of our lives, even early in this year. But there are also many wins along the way that get overshadowed by our negativity biased survival instinct. Studies have shown that something very positive will generally have less of an impact on a person's behavior and cognition than something equally emotional, but negative. The negativity bias has been investigated within many different domains, including the formation of impressions and general evaluations, attention, learning, memory, decision makings, and of course, risk considerations. So when you prepare to tell a story about what's at stake for your customer, how well do you know them and which way they lean? Do they lean towards a negative mindset or one of abundance? Will they be more likely to respond to a FOMO story of what they stand to lose by not buying into your offering? Or do you tell them what I call a FOMI, a for me, a FOMI story, what they stand to gain by working with you? Here's a simple story crafting exercise. Okay, so grab a piece of paper and at the very top of it, write the description of one of the audiences that you identified in chapter two. I'd take your number one audience, just put that up there. Then draw a line down the middle. Title the left column FOMO, F-O-M-O, for the stories you might tell that play off their negativity bias, highlighting what they stand to lose by remaining in status quo. At the top of the right column, you guessed it. Write FOME, F-O-M-E, for the positive stories you can tell about what they stand to gain. Then fill out the columns aiming for at least three example stories in each. Remember that when you tell these stories, they're not about you. They are about your audience. Make sure that they can relate to the person at the center of your story. These are real stories about the impact that you make in customers' lives, people that you have helped that are just like them. And don't forget to use the five primal elements of a short story that makes a big impact. That little story framework is invaluable. These are the anecdotes that will trigger their will to act, creating their want for your physical product or service that fulfills their emotional wish. For more on how to connect with what's at stake for your audiences, buy your copy of my new book, Brand Bewitchery on Amazon or Apple Books. You can also take advantage of my DIY online story cycle system tutorial at businessofstory.thinkific.com. Or you can have both and me guiding you live through the story cycle system by joining an upcoming Build a Better Brand story sprint. What do you stand to gain? Well, how about the confidence of a crystal clear brand story and the amazing growth that comes with knowing how to tell it easily? What do you stand to lose by not acting? Well, you can remain mired in the malaise of a foggy vision and mission. 
your people can continue casting about trying to figure out what your story is, which totally impacts productivity. You can wake up at 3 a.m. dreading the coming day and wondering what it's going to take to trigger sales. Your call. Are you driven by FOMO or FOMI? Your business stories must play to the primal survival instinct of the brain. When done well, they are messaging hacks that allow you to cut through the noise and hook the hearts of your audiences. And with us today to explore our cerebral world is Tim Ash, an acknowledged authority on evolutionary psychology and digital marketing. He is a sought-after international keynote speaker and the best-selling author of Unleash Your Primal Brain, demystifying how we think and why we act. And so storytelling is similar to that. It's simulation. If I tell you a story, you're going to get secondhand experience without having to live through it or, or subjecting yourself to dangers, which is why a lot of our dreams are also negative. We're simulating dangerous stuff without paying the consequences of, of the danger. Tim is also author of Landing Page Optimization, with over 50,000 copies sold worldwide. And it's been translated into six languages. He's been named by Forbes as the top 10 online marketing expert and by Entrepreneur Magazine as an online marketing influencer to watch. Tim is also a highly ranked keynote speaker and has presented at over 200 events across four continents. In the mid-1990s, he became one of the early pioneers in the discipline of website conversion rate optimization, or CRO. Tim has helped a number of major brands develop successful web marketing initiatives, including the likes of Google, Expedia, eHarmony, Facebook, American Express, and so many more. You're going to love this show because Tim is here to share with you what he's learned about the evolutionary reasons behind our need to tell stories, understanding the key requirements of a story to make them work, to see why the same story can have a radically different impact depending on the recipient, and why your, mine, and our customer brains don't know the difference between fact or fiction. So please welcome to the business of story, Tim Ash. Tim, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Park. Great to be with you. I need to give a big shout out to our mutual buddy, Douglas Burdett of the Marketing Book Podcast, who was just recently on my show. And when we were all said and done, he said, you have to get Tim on your show. And so, of course, I said to Douglas, you have to connect us. And I'm really <laughs> glad he did. Well, Douglas is awesome. And I really enjoyed my chat with him on, on his podcast. Well, and I, I was mentioning this before we started, it was a lot of fun to read your book and then listen to that particular episode on, on Douglas's show at the same time, because I, I got so many different uh, insights and angles on your content by hearing you talking about it and, of course, reading your book. So well done on, on both accounts. Thank you. I appreciate that. My biggest question, first and foremost, so you have all of this expertise in evolutionary biology and you know storytelling and, and how our brains work and whatever, but you really seem to me at least get your start in like SEO marketing in the early 1990s and website design and, and interface. And I was curious, how did you get into that and how did that propel you to where you are today? Because they seem like while they are connected, they are such different disciplines. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I came out to University of California, San Diego. It's now rated as a, a top 25 in the world school, even though it's existed for only 60 years. And while I was there, undergraduate and graduate school, I actually studied cognitive science and computers. So in a way, you could say I was preparing for a career in internet marketing, which is the qualitative stuff and all the measurable quantitative stuff. Uh, you know, my graduate work was in what you'd call neural networks or deep learning or artificial intelligence these days. Uh, but we were working in the early days back in the late, 90, eight, late 80s and 90s. And the field really took off once the Internet came along and there was plenty of data to train these AI systems on. So I guess you could always say I've been interested in the brain, cognition, how it works. And for 25 years, I applied it to marketing by running my own conversion rate optimization agency. We basically help websites be more efficient and more effective. 
uh, and we created 1.2 billion in value for clients all over the world. So, and it's now it's come full circle. I uh, sold my stake in the agency and the conference series that I ran here and in Europe on it. And now I want to talk about the stuff that feeds my mind, my heart, my brain, which is explaining to others how the brain really works. It's an interesting connection, though, from sort of the dehumanized tech world of the interwebs and to make <laughs> it very much of a human experience. And when in the early 1990s, you were inventing this along with many other people. But I would imagine there was a lot of trial and error, trial by fire. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about uh, conversion rate optimization, uh, we're making websites more effective. And we learned in the trenches, like you say, what really works. Uh, and you can't bullshit that zero moment of truth. Someone shows up on your site, they either act or they don't. But my big problem with it, most of our clients are ethical, I would say, but a few, uh, not so much, you know, and what I realized is, is with this coming power of, you know, data scientists on their side and AI, that these giant corporations are just strip mining us for money, um, manipulating us psychologically, dividing us politically. I mean, and not just corporations, governments do this too. And we're, you know, seeing those three blinking dots on Facebook and dopamines firing, and we don't even realize what they're doing to us. So my attempt with this book was really to level the playing field. So we'd stop bringing the proverbial knife to the gunfight. I wanted to explain to us, to, to regular people without scientific jargon, how your brain really works and bust all the myths about it. So at least we had a fighting chance in this environment of, uh, you know, I guess you could say social manipulation that we find ourselves in. To me, it's an interesting push-pull between our frontal cortex, which I kind of think of like Moore's law. We are so brilliant. We're able to create these transistors that you know, double, triple in their capacity within a, a specific amount of time, which then leads to this technology that can enable us to do way more, which in, then leads to the Moore's Law of Communication, where we are just constantly bombarding our brains with this stuff. Yet, is it safe to say in your research that you and I and everybody else listening to this, all of us homo sapiens, are still running around with the same basic brain apparatus that our ancestors used to navigate and survive the savanna 30, 40, 50,000 years ago. So it has evolved at like Darwin's pace while our frontal brilliance is like overwhelming it. And these are kind of the two worlds that you play in? Yeah, in a way. I would say that um, for purposes of what's our brain right now, we're frozen in time. In other words, on the time scale of your life or mine, and before we drive off the climate extinction cliff, your brain's not going to evolve, okay? In fact, actually, evolution is speeding up uh, in the last 50,000 years at a biological level as well within us. But it's happening so slowly that for practical reasons, you can con consider that uh, we're flies in amber. But we have to go back more than a couple of hundred thousand years to the plains of East Africa and the Serengeti because to understand our brain, you have to retrace the whole evolutionary arc. There's stuff we share with insects, with reptiles, with other mammals, with other great apes. And only later, very recently, did we layer on all the truly human stuff. So it depends on which part of the brain is active. And those are shared with some really primitive forms of life, or I should say early forms of life. The reason it's still inside of us is because all that stuff works. And so we've just kind of upgraded a few things on top of it, but the basic operating system is still the same in many cases. Well, in your book, Unleash Your Primal Brain, you cover a, a, a large expanse of this knowledge. And what I want to really focus on is chapter 16, when you're talking about let me tell you a story, mm. being the business of story. I'm fascinated to always learn and to share with my audiences how our brain works, and why in the world story is so important in our life today in every aspect of our life, and why don't we use it more in business to really, mm. really have the impact in the world we're trying to make. I know, a lot loaded up there. So <laughs> let's right, well, we unpack it little by little. That is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about why storytelling. Why? What is it about storytelling that us homo sapiens were drawn to, naturally did, or which made us the most aggressive, invasive species of all time? <laughs> yeah, the plague of locusts, I call it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've succeeded, unfortunately, beyond our and the ecosystem's wildest dreams. So well, let's go back to the beginning then. Um, 
And again, this isn't just the human thing. Why do we need stories? Well, stories explain the world. And to take that back from an evolutionary standpoint, that means we have to have a model of how the world works. If this happens, then this follows. We basically need a sense of causality, of something unfolding in time that we can predict. You know, if, if I step on this uh, cactus, it's going to hurt. You know, it, it seems kind of obvious, but um, that's the reason for finding order in the world. We need uh, patterns. We need linear patterns that we can kind of predict from, and that helps us survive. So at the very basic level, we all share that need to create order out of the chaos with other you know, more advanced animals. And that is a pure survival instinct, first and foremost, isn't it? Absolutely. So like I said, if you can predict dangerous situations or uh, positive situations which help you survive, then your chances of survival are higher. So it, we learn from our experience. We learn from things that happen in our lives. It's a very personal kind of thing. A lot of this uh, learning about the world gets wired in in our early years, first five, if you want to think about it that way. And that's almost at the level of biology. Whatever we learn then is hardwired into us. Um, and so it's childhood trauma is very horrible. A good attachment to your parents when you're young is a very powerful head start on a lot of life. So those things get wired in, but we're always learning from our environment and in the case of humans, other people around us. We may seem like helpless blubbering babies, but we're actually intensely watching everything and we have more mirror neurons which uh, automatically mimic other people than any other species by far. Well, you mentioned that in the beginning of that chapter, storytelling is a form of mind reading. Can you mm -hmm. kind of unpack that for us? Sure. Well, there's there's literally almost, I don't know if you're a Star Trek fan, but the Vulcan mind meld that Mr. Mm -hmm. Spock used to do and read other people's minds, that's literally what happens when we tell a story. I mean, there's different kinds of language processing. So there's the sound production and understanding of that. Then there's the making meaning out of those words, then extracting the concepts out of um, the, the meaning and so on. In fact, you can tell a story and I can translate a story and tell it to somebody else in another language and they'll extract the same meaning. And what I mean by that is the same parts of their brain will light up as the storyteller. So we're literally with a small delay syncing up the head of one person with the head of another when we're telling a story. In your past life, when you were doing this SEO optimization and, and working on, what did, what did you learn that surprised you about the brain that we can really take you know, note of today on how we interact and how we are telling ourselves stories of what we're seeing online and whether that's a good experience or a bad experience? How do you see those two worlds or what did you learn when you saw those two worlds coming together? Well, you might, my specialty actually wasn't in search engine optimization. It was conversion rate optimization. They both have that optimization yep. word in it. But CRO, which is what I did, is um, about making websites more efficient. So it's more, it's the same. It doesn't matter how you get people to your website. The question is, do they act when they get there? And so that's kind of a, a mix of qualitative and quantitative stuff, but essentially we're using psychology and measuring the effect of changing website content and see what people are responding to. So it was very much a psychological thing. And uh, so I built my agency, which I used to run called SiteTuner, still around doing really well now, um, basically on the back of what I'd call neuromarketing or these durable psychological and evolutionary biological basis for our I guess you'd call them irrational decision-making. And once you understand that, it becomes really easy to predict how people are going to behave. That we're not some kind of logical robots that are always maximizing our value, you know, or anything like that. And in, in doing that, then, are you planning on and counting on irrational subconscious behaviors that are, ha are playing out Absolutely. in the background? I mean, there's a Nobel Prizes recently awarded to people like Richard Thaler in economics that basically bust the idea that we're always acting in our rational self-interest. It turns out we misfire in all kinds of ways, but people look at that as like a glitch in the matrix or a problem, and it's really not. Because again, if you look at what got us here and the evolution, it makes perfect sense. Uh, a lot of these things aren't irrational. They're rational from a survival self-interest standpoint. The problem is we're 
you say not running around in East Africa anymore with a few dozen other people. We're living in these giant hives involving billions of people on the planet. Uh, and, it, and sometimes in that setting, it can be counterproductive for sure. Can you give us a couple of examples of these uh, uh, subconscious reactions that you saw happening in marketing that are really based in our survival instincts? We don't even know that are playing behind, you know, going on in the back of our heads. Well, I, I'll give you a perfect example, not necessarily even from marketing, but when you're at the grocery store, when you used to shop for yourself pre-pandemic, um, there's all those uh, when you're checking out, what are the magazines you see? It's all that trash. It's, you know, Tiger Beat and People Magazine and TMZ and all of that, right? Why do we follow celebrities? Well, when we were in a tribe of a few dozen people, our, our brain, you know, that, that rational brain you're talking about is actually there to model the interactions of our social tribe. And it's to understand all the relationships. So if I did a good job on Douglas's podcast, he's going to be on yours and he's going to do a shout out and I end up on your podcast. This is great. Okay. So to be able to model those kind of causal chains within our small group of 100 to 200 people. The problem we have when we're in a society of billions and then there are people like Michael Jackson and Beyonce is that we gossip about celebrities as if they were in our little group of 100 to 200 people because that was survival for us. But it's kind of a misfire because we don't know them personally and we have no personal benefit from trading that gossip information. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I mentioned this on a couple of other shows, so those regular listeners are going to hear this again. But one of my favorite artists today, music musicians today, is Ben Folds. And I don't know if you know him, Ben Folds, Ben Folds 5, uh, pop, rock, piano, songwriter. Mm -hmm. Just, I've, I've loved his music for a couple decades now. And because of COVID, he's stuck in an apartment in Melbourne, Australia. And he's been doing this Patreon thing. By the way, times. good place to be stuck. That's a fantastic yeah. city. Seriously. Yeah, I don't know if he gets to get out and have that much fun. But he consistently, I mean, it's the best $9 I spend a month comes on and does these live sessions and, uh, and he inter interacts with you and you can ask him questions and he's right there. And he is for you that whole time in that crowd. There could be anywhere from 40 to 120 people participating and they are all around the world. Now, none of us really know each other. We don't mm -hmm. even interact outside that group. And Ben is there doing a wonderful job of cultivating his fans, but being there, I mean, he is very, very present the whole time. And when I read that part in your book about that, I thought, well, I'm playing into that because here's like a social tribe for me, but these people will never protect me from the saber tooth tiger. That's right. Then they're probably not genetically related to you, which yeah. was another important part of being tribal. It's also taking care of your genes because you're probably... Uh, loosely related to anyone. If you had a kid, there was uncertain paternity. It wasn't clear it was your kid. You, so everybody in that group, you had some kind of father, uncle, cousin, um, you know, grandpa relationship to most likely. And you're certainly not to those people yeah. gathering virtually on a Zoom meeting. Total complete strangers. What do we have? An interest in common is music, music composition, songwriting, and Ben Folds at mm -hmm. the center of that tribe. And yet it's all completely and utterly virtual, even though it's real time. But to me, that was fascinating. It's Well, actually, but, you know, at least you get some psychic satisfaction by being live with people that share that passion of yours, uh, or, you know, reading about them in a magazine or hearing about them on some kind of, uh, you know, news story, people that you don't ever touch or interact with. Again, that's a misfire. That's when you get superstars that you think of as being included in your personal tribe. Well, with any little bit of reading around this, and you have a wonderful index of books that have helped inform your reading in the, in the writing of your book, it, it is, just seems so obvious to the trained mind that storytelling is like our primal, primitive superpower. Mm -hmm. It's what you can connect with people from around the world and literally bewitch them. You can yes. make them laugh. You can make them cry. You can give them shivers. Yet in business it's like frowned upon. I think it's changing. There seems to be a movement towards we need to start doing a better job of telling our story. What is it about evolution in your studies that have got us to where we are so smart today and we can build all of this technology, and yet it seems like this technology of connecting through the power of a verbal story or a written story 
appears to be lost on us. Well, okay. So let, let, let's talk about that because I want to unpack a little bit. Um, I think that um, to be clear again, the, the cerebral cortex, the neocortex, the, the big part of the brain that we think of as being distinctly human is there to model social relationships. And literally the second you stop doing seven plus seven equals 14, it goes back to modeling social relationships. Okay. So you're doing that constantly. That's the default network in your brain. Is social thinking. So I personally believe that when we don't pay attention to the social stuff, the kind of nerd scientist, the Einstein, the autistic person, those are people that are not reading the social cues. So they have all this extra brain power to apply to engineering, to creative tasks, to music. Um, and they're the ones inventing microwave ovens and rockets to send us to the moon. The rest of us are like idea super spreaders that are just gossiping and being social and, and focusing on our particular social tribe. So I think just a few people are doing the heavy lifting of technological advancing. But arguably, the fact that the rest of us are so social is actually even more important because those ideas get spread around so quickly and we all benefit from them. So then with that pretext. And how come more leaders in organizations don't use storytelling to bring their tribes together and their people together and share a vision versus being more, I don't know, incremental leadership I hear about a lot. You know, it's just all about the numbers. Incrementally, let's do this without having the transformation that can come from connecting with your people on a level of story that has brought us, I might argue, might be more important for our evolution and survival than our opposable thumbs. Yeah, so it's a, that's a great question. So let's look at it now at a human level. What are the two purposes of storytelling? I think it's important, again, to understand this from an evolutionary perspective. The first is simulation. Okay. Now we do a lot of simulation. We have mirror neurons. Like I said, we watch, even though our bodies aren't mature, everything going on around us. My 15 and a half year old kid, just apparently my wife let him drive the car back from the grocery store today. I'm going to kill her. I just found this out, but apparently he didn't kill anyone along the way, but he's been watching me drive and her drive and other people drive all his life. So in a way you could say he has a lot of practice already by watching driving, right? So stories are like that. We do the same thing in dreams. We literally disconnect our bodies, all the uh, voluntary movement in our bodies and paralyze our bodies so we can act out stuff in dreams without flailing around in real life. Um, and all of that is giving us practice for meaningful environments. And so storytelling is similar to that. It's simulation. If I tell you a story, um, you're going to get secondhand experience without having to live through it or, or subjecting yourself to dangers, which is why a lot of our dreams are also negative. We're simulating dangerous stuff without paying the consequences of, of the danger. So simulation and practice is really an important function of story. The other one, I think the one you'd be more interesting uh, from the perspective of business is the idea that it's reinforcing and spreading cultural knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so we have a cultural tribe, like I said, usually is genetically related to us. And so to be able to have our tribe win against another tribe and triumph, we have to effectively spread knowledge. So stories reinforce values and culture and strengthen our tribe. I'm curious, have you ever read Lisa Cron's book, Wired for Story? I, I, I've, I've, I have read it, uh, but it was a while ago. Yeah. Uh, it, and it's fascinating because it covers a lot of the same ideas about simulation and rehearsing and that we get to live vicariously through the heroes in our story so that we get to try on their trouble. Yep. From the safety of our own home just yes. to determine what we would do in case that trouble ever happened. I, I mean, the stuff that always pulls me in is... Saving Private Ryan and the Matrix and Lord of the Rings. I mean, it's like massive battles against uh, you know, powerful enemies and being, you know, people shooting machine guns at you and stuff like that. It's like, I really don't want to be on that battlefield. But it's, but boy, I go back to that well again and again because I just experiencing it vicariously. And do you think that 
has been around since the beginning of time, since Absolutely. we were. If you, if you look at stories or song, which is another form of story, really, uh, most of them are about relationships. Uh, most of them have human protagonists. And if they're not human, they're cute robots like Wa Wally, right? Or anthropomorphized animals. But we basically, the lessons we need to learn are human. So all of the characters in our story are human. And you know, the, the hero's journey is an obvious uh, example of one, but, uh, you know, there's, the, the world is okay, there's trouble and complications, you go off on a quest, you find unlikely allies, you slay the dragon, and then there's a regreening of the earth, a transformation of some sort. So that story arc of problem re resolution you know, is, is what the simulation is there for. That's why we tell the stories. Yeah, it's that problem solution dynamic, and in sales, so often, how do you see, you see this? Someone shows up to sell you something, and hi, I'm Park from such and such a company, and we make this absolute best widget that can do this, 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 this. Do you want to buy some? And yeah. they start with Act One, and they go right to Act Three without delving into the real problem that they're solving for. That's right. Our brains are wired for problem solution dynamic. Yeah, and so, and so there's a there's a pretty bad book, but with some important principles on the sales psychology. You you might have heard of it. It's by Neil Rackham. It's called Spin Selling. It's been around for a while. So, mm -hmm. but one of the things he says is like, get some factual um, information, dig into the implications of that really rub salt into the wound and then say, what would life be like if these problems didn't exist? Right. And so you take them down into the bowels of hell and back out into the light again, and you still haven't even told them about your product or solution. Right. Because with first you have to take them on that story roller coaster, make them understand the full implications of the problems that they're facing. And only then will they value what you're selling. And that's that simulation side of storytelling. You are exactly. simply trying to tell them a fiction, essentially, to get them to buy into it so that you can say, here's what tomorrow could look like for you, which is really just another fiction. Yeah. And you mentioned yeah. in your yeah. book, that's a powerful one, visioning, you know, um, vision boards, um, intention setting, gratitude journals, all of that stuff. I'm in California or a little more airy fairy, I guess you could say out here. But, you know, the stories you tell yourself are also a really, really important thing too, because you can overcome any kind of logical stuff with the power of your primal brain uh, by telling yourself the right stories. Yeah, that's so true. You talk about how important sleep is. And I know this is going to seem like maybe a little uh, rabbit hole from storytelling, but it does play into storytelling because those hours, that hour or two leading up to sleep are so important. Mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of like what you were putting into the theater of your mind consciously and subconsciously that once you lay down and get into sleep mode, that it starts playing through different scenarios with that information. Yep, exactly right. So the things that you focus on in the hour before sleep are processed five to six times more than the rest of the day's events combined. So things you're likely to be thinking about as you drift off into sleep are more likely to show up in your dreams. And, and get disproportionately weighed in terms of the attention that you give them. And let's then just talk about that. If we are not taking enough time for our sleep and really making that important part of our life and our brain health and function, what happens and how, in your experience, can we do a better job of that? Because I'm for one, ever since this COVID thing hits, Tim, I wake up sometimes at 2.30 in the morning, sometimes 4.30 in the morning, occasionally 7 in the morning. I am across the board and I'm functioning on anywhere from five and a half to six and a half to seven hours of sleep, maybe. Yeah, Park, you're not functioning. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I'm impressed, but uh, that's catastrophic breakdown. Um, after 16 hours, your brain starts breaking down. It's daily life support. We basically have, two, uh, well, three phases of sleep, but two types of sleep. Uh, restorative sleep that washes things away, and then active sleep, which um, saves the important stuff from the previous day and integrates it with our past experiences. So it flushes out first the stuff we don't need, and then it kind of reinforces the things that we need to remember from a survival standpoint. And human beings, when we came out of the trees and ended up on the plains of Africa, we had to compress our sleep because it was so dangerous down there on the ground. Other great apes sleep an average of 10 to 15 hours a day. We compressed our sleep to eight. And we have a much 
a more complex brain that has to get serviced in that off time. So there's extra demands on our time. We need seven to nine hours religiously. Most of our REM sleep is happening at the end of the night in that last 90 minute sleep cycle. So if you think you're you're functioning on six hours of sleep, two six hour sleep days is the same as losing a full night of sleep. Do you have any recommendations for me? Uh, yeah, well, in my case, one of the things I do is I don't keep my phone in my bedroom. Okay. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah, yeah. I go to sleep at the same time every night. Uh, a little tweak is a whole separate rabbit hole, but electrical grounding is really important. We evolved for that. All life did it, but we're in insulated houses, wearing rubber shoes, rolling around in cars with rubber tires. We're never grounded. So I use a grounding pad right now under my office desk and one across my bed. So I sleep grounded and that's really helped me. Now I just wake up very naturally at first light, which is about 6, 630. That means I need to be in bed by 10 to get my eight hours of sleep. And uh, interesting. I've never heard of that. A grounding pad. Yeah, so. yeah, or it's also for the human kind of application. It's called earthing. So there's a movie, the earthing movie, definitely or a documentary, definitely worth a watch. It'll really blow your mind. Interesting. Okay. Back out of the rabbit hole. Back in, because <laughs> you know what? These stories all happen in the theater of our mind. So we got to keep that theater as clean and polished and working as possible, right? <laughs> What in your experience, and you have done keynotes and do keynotes all around the world, um, and you use a lot of storytelling and narrative arc in your presentations. What have you found? Uh, are there frameworks that you use? Do you go in? Because I, what I like to teach is we are all intuitive storytellers, but you need to become intentional so yeah. that you actually use these frameworks. What do you do to become intentional with your storytelling? As a public speaker, I went through several phases. The first was to know what I'm talking about and to be able to just say it. Uh, then I thought that the more information I gave people, the better. So it was death by PowerPoint, and I would just fire hose them with good information. And then what I uh, started noticing is that the, um, the little anecdotes, uh, sometimes it wasn't the correct information that was important. It was the flavor of it. And sometimes telling a joke or a, a little side story, like we've been doing all along in this interview, is really the most powerful way to get people's attention. Uh, it's a, a couple of things that are important about that is one, you have to understand your audience because the story you tell is going to be received differently by different people. And the other thing that's important is uh, telling a story captures attention and it's an attention reset. Human attention is about seven to nine minutes long. So whatever you're saying, you better say it more quickly than that and have another story to, ready to go to grab their attention again. And you say an attention reset. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, basically people get bored and they tune out. Uh, they, they, they think they can predict you as a speaker or you as a teacher or you as a provider of information of anything useful. So, I've heard him speak. He's speaking at the same tone of voice about the same thing. And he keeps speaking about it. And he's speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking about it. So at some point, we just tune out. There's nothing new to be learned. For, uh, we've heard, we've been on enough Zoom meetings and webinars lately, especially, that it's just, uh, you can't sustain that. So you have to shake them out of it. You have to have something shocking or attention grabbing um, in order to reset people's attention. And novelty and surprise. Yes. And then, but then, the, like I said, one of the most important things about storytelling is you have to understand the audience. And I mean, I know that's a truism, but it's it's so important. I'll give you an example. I'm going to tell you an objective story. Are you ready? This is the one I mm -hmm. use in my book. So uh, the matador deftly sidestepped the charging bull in the arena and thrust his sword from above between its shoulder blades, piercing its heart and killing it instantly. Right. Now, that's a sensory story. In other words, it, uh, you're, I'm describing something that happened. There's no value judgments there. And if you're in Spain and you love bullfighting, then this story is about being an impeccable warrior and tradition and man against overcoming powerful forces of nature, right? All of this stuff. And if you're from the people for the ethical treatment of animals, PETA, you think this is animal torture. It's barbaric and it's being subsidized by people paying money to watch this killing of animals and it's disgusting and needs to be ended. 
So did you notice it was the same exact story, but it's going to be perceived very differently based on the cultural package of the tribe and the audience. And so that's something that's really critical to understand. So stories reinforce our cultural values. I can create a version in one audience with that story and a f affinity in another audience with the same exact story. Have you seen that happen in your own world, given as many speeches and, and keynotes as you have, that you had two completely different audiences, but you told the sto same story purposely, strategically going after two different effects? Um, yeah, well, I think more, I learned from my mistakes and I've had misfires on stage. Certainly one time I was presenting in front of what turned out to be a very young kind of millennial audience, a bunch of marketing low level doers, um, not thinkers, but doers. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm a Gen Xer. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to be more like a millennial and wear my ripped jeans and drop a lot of F-bombs. And man, I'm completely misread that audience. Um. So I was rated in the bottom third, uh, and that really ouched. I, I, I can only imagine what – the only thing I console myself with is there were a third of the speakers were even worse than me, uh, but that, that was definitely a learning experience. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel your pain. I've been there myself. But it goes back to understanding, well, knowing how powerful stories are, and they can evoke a very positive or a very negative reaction out of the same crowd. So when you were doing your presentations and you talk about an overall narrative arc, do you rely on any structures all up the hero's journey or anything like that when you're thinking through it? There are people that rehearse their presentations, uh, and this is appropriate for some. I've, I've found out fairly recently, last two or three years, that they're excellent keynote speakers that are introverts. And they literally practice every vocal inflection and every move on the stage and rehearse it a hundred times. I'm not that guy. Okay, I'm an extrovert. I'm comfortable with the loose framework and winging it. I have my supporting very visual slides, which is also very important. We're visual, so as little text as possible and rely on visuals or, or even movement and videos and things like that. Your own stage presence really matters because um, there's an old study that was about 7% of the information is transmitted by what we're saying. About a third is tone of voice and two thirds is body language. So it's really important to bring all of that to the storytelling. You want to impact people, you're only playing with 7% by transmitting the information. So get the tone of voice and the body language right if you want to be persuasive. Do you have any specific storytelling tips from what you know about the brain? If someone is going to tell an anecdote, any structure or framework to that anecdote that they've really got to pay attention to? Uh, repetition and surprise, we've kind of touched on that. Rule of threes is another really important one. Repetition is critical because um, we expect to see a certain pattern and we want just enough novelty in there to be surprised, but we don't want to be in total chaos. It's the difference between it being in a heavy metal concert and, and ah, you know, everything's 130 decibels, right? You, you can't withstand that wall of noise. A good a um, melody that unfolds and a sub pattern that repeats gives you enough of a comfort level following along, but then there's all these twists and turns and surprises. When I used to salsa dance, I, I had this rule where I do 85% in the woman's comfort zone. So imagine you ask someone to dance, you've never met them before. And so the first test drive is like figure out what their comfort zone is very quickly, zero in on that. 85% of the time I'm going to spend in that comfort zone. So they're, they don't freeze up, fight or flight, and they're, they're enjoying the experience. And then that little 15% is the thrill. I give them a little dip, or I, or I pause and hold for a couple of beats in the music and play, play off of it almost like another member of the band, right? So it's that tension between familiarity and the unexpected that keeps us in the right zone, if you will, both as a listener or as a dance partner. You know, a writer from the Atlantic, Derek Thompson, he was on the show and he wrote a really great book called Hitmakers. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but you, you might find it fascinating. And he that's the basic premise of his book. How do you make a hit? How much of it is luck? How much of it can, is it something that you can really put together, you know, and think through? So we're talking hit movies, hit books, hit TV shows, uh, songs, whatever. And his core theme time and time again is you have to be familiar but with a surprise that yes. you can't show up with creativity because people say that's really cool, 
what is it? Yeah. Versus I've never thought about it that way. And I thought that was a really fascinating way of looking at what you're talking about. And which, well. which is also why humor works, right? Um, we, you, you're going along, you're going along, and all of a sudden whoosh, you boomerang them into, you know, the punchline is the surprise. They weren't expecting it. Mm -hmm. um, like, okay, horrible, quick joke. It's like, uh, what's black and white and red all over? You know, like the typical answer, most people even know that joke is like the newspaper, right? Um, if people remember newspapers. But my answer is a nun with a spear through her neck that can't fit through a revolving door. I mean, yeah. so you see what I mean? It's like, it's just like, what? Oh, and then you think, yeah, black, white, and red. Okay, makes sense. <laughs> Spinning all over the place. Absolutely. <laughs> Fascinating Please stuff. Please don't so, send me hate mail after that joke, especially the... <laughs> well, is it because of the subject matter or is, was it the delivery? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> or both. <laughs> Well, Tim, fascinating. It, what are one or two or three things that a listener should take away from your book? You cover, again, a lot of ground in the mind focused on story and why do you use story or how to use it more powerfully from everything that you've learned about the mind. Mm, I think that, um, well, the book covers so much. I mean, from our happy chemicals to memory to learning gender differences, language, it's it, culture, it's all in there. Um and but you're sitting across from a prospect yep. and you've got you, you you've got to connect with them. You've got to share something that's changing in their world to shake them out of status quo thinking so that they can actually look into and uh, imagine a brighter tomorrow, which is complete fiction until they experience it. Is there any secret? Yeah. Yes. So, so one of the things that I like, uh, Orrin Claff um, has this uh, this book where he take, talks about taking frame control in meetings. And if you have two different frames or points of view, they're going to collide and one's going to absorb the other and win. And so if anyone's coming at you with the analyst frame, and this happens a lot in marketing and sales situation, well, let's take a look at the numbers. You know, you say, well, you know what? That's all in the appendix. You guys are free to look at that later. But let me tell you a story. And that right there just completely judo moves them and is like a hip throw. You can't resist that. Then you go into telling one or two prepared anecdotes and you stop and you don't talk about the ending and you go back to what you were saying in the purpose of the meeting. And then you loop back later and you close off and finish the story. And they're forced to pay attention and sit in that tension of the untold, unfinished story. So that I thought was a fantastic uh, you know, practical trick, if you will, that involves storytelling. And it goes back to that old Hollywood screenwriter saw of, if you show a gun in act one, you better fire it in act three. <laughs> what you're saying is show them the gun, but let them wait and wonder when in the world you're going to pull the trigger yeah, on. And it's such an effective device since you're talking about movies or TV. There's the, okay, you start off with a really uh, strong hook and then you go back and all of a sudden flashes to two weeks earlier. And then you get the unfolding story of how you ended up in that situation. And that closes the circuit for you by the end of the experience. Tarantino, I guess that's all I can think of is that boy, he does that all the time. And you're like, where are we going with this? <laughs> Tim, this has been absolutely fabulous having you here. And thanks for taking the time. Um, any last parting thoughts or shots for our listeners? Uh, yeah, if someone's interested in uh, finding out more about the book, they're welcome to check out primalbrain.com. I narrated the audiobook. It's also available as an ebook and autographed copies for me on the site right now, but it'll be on Amazon in April. Um, and then if you're interested in uh, public speaking or more of my digital marketing consulting, just go to timash.com. So then the final question with all of that, what in all of the work you do is the one big problem you solve for people? I help them understand how their brain really works so they can apply it to their personal and their business life. Perfect. Boy, can I use that. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Park. Thank you all for listening to this edition. If you liked what you heard, please share this episode around and check out his book. It's fantastic. Uh, you unleash your primal brain, demystifying how we think and why we act. There is so much great knowledge in there. And listen to him on Douglas Burdett's uh, The Marketing Book Podcast show. A really fascinating interview as well. 
If I can be of service to you, come on over to businessofstory.com where I can help you. I've got tools, tips, techniques, and talent like Tim there. That's a lot of T's uh, to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. If you are interested in taking a Build a Better Brand Story Sprint, I've got more planned for 2021. Just visit the site and you can find a sprint for you there. Of course, you can download, get my book, uh, Brand Bewitchery on Amazon or Apple Books. And what? The final pitch for you is my online course. If you would like to do your own story in a DIY fashion, clarify your brand story and learn some primal narrative frameworks on how to tell it, then visit it at businessofstory.thinkific.com. And until next week, when we will have another amazing story artist here for you like Tim, remember that the most potent story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks so much for listening.